I'm going to present the evidence that ultraviolet B irradiance and vitamin D reduce the risk of cancer. I have funding from a number of organizations, uh, which I'm very thankful for. So I'm going to discuss today the, uh, how vitamin D, uh, the mechanisms that vitamin D reduces the risk of cancer, the types of evidence for benefits with findings from ecological studies to observational studies. Um, Joan has already uh, uh, talked about the um, uh, randomized controlled trial. Prostate cancer, I'll discuss that in a bit of detail because that's a little contentious. I'll then discuss Hill's uh, criteria for causality in a biological system, the general benefits of increasing 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels, and mention my project uh, with John Connell's Vitamin D Council on 100 vitamin D sensitive health conditions. So the number of mechanisms whereby vitamin D may reduce the risk of cancer, and I think you've heard of many of these today, so um, uh, we don't really have to go over these right now. There are four types of basic types of epidemiological studies that are used to identify and quantify links between risk modifying factors and disease. Uh, the first three of these are called observational studies. You have the nested case control studies uh, uh, where a population to follow for years after blood draw and you look for cases in that cohort and then match them with uh, controls. Unfortunately, the accuracy of this approach seems to decrease with time since the blood draw because vitamin D levels can change with time. There are case control studies where you look at the, draw the blood at time of diagnosis. Cross-sectional studies where you survey a large population, sort of go throughout the population and, and just look at people, find out their condition and their vitamin D levels, for example. And then ecological studies in which populations are defined geographically um, and you can average both disease outcome and risk modifying factors by region of study. The first epide uh, ecological study, or first epidemiological study hypothesizing that solar ultraviolet B radiation through production of vitamin D uh, reduced risk of cancer was an ecological study published in 1980 by the brothers Cedric and Frank Garland. They actually were beginning uh, graduate students at John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins School of Public Health in 1974 and they looked at the new map of colon cancer mortality rates in the United States, which only had five different uh, scales at that time. And the only cancer that leaped out of them and said uh, there may be a sunshine effect was colon cancer. And they, had, they had just driven from San Diego to Baltimore, and they knew it was very sunny in the Southern California and Arizona and New Mexico, and not very sunny in Baltimore. And they, they knew that the, one of the important physiological effects of sunlight was vitamin D production, so they just hypothesized that sunlight through production of vitamin D reduced the risk of cancer. Uh, it took them six years to get that paper published because the mainstream journals just didn't want to handle it. It was finally a British journal, the Jur International Journal of Epidemiology, that finally published it in 1980. So hats off to the, the British. Here is a more recent version of the map they looked at. Uh, this now has 10 different color scales. Uh, dark red is high, high risk, high ri mortality rate up to 30 deaths per 100,000 per year. B dark blue is, is low, down as low as 9 uh, deaths per 100,000 per year. Overlaid are, are contours of annual solar radiation, and you can see that the lowest are up in the n New York state area, the highest are in the um, New Mexico area. And there's a rough correspondence between um, annual solar radiation and mortality rate, an inverse correlation. Uh, they also identified breast cancer as UVB vitamin D sensitive in 1989-1990. You see the pattern is very similar, although the western states are somewhat different. They also identified ovarian cancer around 1992 as uh, UVB sensitive, vitamin D sensitive. Again, that's similar, a little bit of difference in the upper uh, states. Now, look at gastric cancer, that's also similar to, to the others, although along the border with Mexico, there are elevated gastric cancer rates, and that's because we had a lot of Mexicans and Central Americans living along the border, and it turns out that they have a, a much higher infection rate of, of H. pylori uh, there, and bring it up to California and Arizona, New Mexico. Uh, so that has to be factored into the analysis. And if you look, uh, there are other, hot spots here and there. Um, uh, here's corpus uteri or endometrial cancer. Again, it's similar to, to the others. 
So, we, uh, so in 1999, when these papers were, the new atlas was published, I, I looked at them and I, I saw the great similarity between many types of cancer. And at first I was a little naive and I thought, well, maybe, uh, I'd, I'd just been studying diet and Alzheimer's disease, diet and prostate cancer, diet and colon cancer, diet and heart disease, and I thought I could do an ecological study on, on cancer in the United States. Well, it didn't take more than about a week to realize that Americans pretty much eat the same food throughout the entire country. We shop, eat at McDonald's and shop at Safeway and get the same uh, diet. So then I had to go back to the, the paper by the Garland brothers and, and proceed from there. And I worked for NASA at the time and was a, I was, uh, actually got to fly around the world and measure ozone and aerosols using a laser system. And I was aware of the NASA uh, total ozone mapping spectrometer instrument that had measured surface solar UVB in the United States for July 1992. And what you see here is that the, the, the highest rates, where the yellow and the, the, the lavender are, is in the southwest. The <coughs> lowest dose is in the northeast of uh, Maine. And it turns out that there are two, two primary reasons for that, uh, maybe three reasons. One is that the surface elevation in the west is somewhat higher than in the east, so there's less a atmosphere to scatter the UVB. The second is that prevailing westerly winds went across the Rocky Mountains, and in doing so, they push the tropopause higher, make the stratospheric ozone layer thinner, and so you have less, of, less absorption of UVB in the west, especially in the southwest. And third thing, you have more clouds and aerosols in the northeast. So these all conspire to, to, um, to give an asymmetrical uh, UVB pattern, which is very, very useful because one of the criticisms of the ecological approach is that it often just uses latitude as the index of UVB and vitamin D. But here is an asymmetrical pattern which works for cancer in the United States. And the IRC, IRC conveniently forgot to mention this paper when they did their, their review of vitamin D and cancer, and I took them to task for that in a rebuttal in 2009. So one can take um, the um, pictures like this, which have about 500 state economic areas, and one can digitize this map and then do correlations between the UVB and the cancer mortality rates. And I published this one in 2002, which is for breast cancer. And you see it has a one slope at, at low levels and then flattens out above about seven kilojoules per meter squared. Uh, for colon cancer, uh, it seems to keep going, uh, not, doesn't flatten out quite as much. Ovarian cancer is similar. Um, cor corpus uteri cancer is similar. Gastric cancer. Now I've cut off gastric cancer at 7.5 kilojoules per, per square meter as opposed to going out to 10 for these because you have the high rates in the sunny areas, which is an artifact of, of having the uh, his, in, people infected with H. pylori living there. So um, after the first publication, the head of epidemiology at the American Cancer Society, Michael Toon, said, well, well, that's interesting, but you haven't included the other uh, cancer risk modifying factors. So I put in smoking, alcohol consumption, Hispanic heritage, um, because white Americans include Hispanic uh, as well as non-Hispanic, um, urban residents and, and poverty, redid the analysis and found that um, the, uh, the, the UVB effect stayed pretty much the same as I found in the first case. In other words, all the confounding factors seemed to sort of be randomly uh, distributed about the UVB. Uh, but we found that um, the results for alcohol, Hispanic heritage, and smoking agreed in the, with the literature for which cancers were affected by these. Uh, one journal, now I, I submitted this, had to submit this to 10 journals to get it published because the mainstream journals, again, didn't want to touch it. Mayo Clinic proceedings came close to uh, accepting it, but they said, look, you're not a trained epidemiologist, being a physicist, you're not a trained statistician, uh, get one of each on your team and we'll reconsider it. So I got Cedric Garland on as a trained epidemiologist. I hired a, a statistician from Toronto, redid the analysis, sent it back to Mayo Clinic proceedings. They said, I'm sorry, we still cannot accept it. But they were just chicken. They just didn't want to deal with it. So finally, it was accepted by Yori Reichsroth, who, ha ha who organizes the vitamin D uh, conferences like the one I'm going to in Hamburg in a couple of days. He accepted it as a conference proceedings paper in 2006, so, uh, uh, published in anti-cancer research, now has over 100 citations, so it's, it's well accepted, but was not accepted by mainstream uh, journals. 
In a meeting uh, with the World Health Organization in Munich in 2005, I showed my ecological findings to the dermatologist, and they said, well, just because somebody lives where it's sunny doesn't mean they go out in the sun. I mean, certainly that's the case in the Middle East, India, uh, and so on. And so I got to thinking, well, maybe there's a personal index of UVB irradiance that can be used to show that UV does reduce the risk of cancer. And I thought, okay, if you develop non-melanoma skin cancer, that's probably an index of, of total UVB irradiance. Melanoma is more to sunburning, and, and that's not a good index. Turns out for Spain, they had a 15-year record of cancer mortality data for the 48 or 49 continental provinces, including an index for non-melanoma skin cancer. So I use that as the index of UVB irradiance. I use latitude and I use lung cancer as the index of smoking. And I show that 17 types of cancer were inversely correlated with, with skin cancer, but after putting in lung cancer and latitude, 14 were still uh, um, found to be good, well correlated with one or another index of, of UVB or vitamin D. In my opinion, the fear of solar UVB spread by well-meaning organizations reduces uh, overall health. Moderate sunlight exposure with as much body surface area exposed as possible in the sun elevation is above 45 degrees is nature's way of, of obtaining vitamin D. The dermatologists say if your shadow is longer than you are, it's okay to go in the sun. We say if your shadow is shorter than you are, that's the time to go in the sun and make vitamin D. But don't stay so long that you get uh, red or burned. Um, now, a lot of, there have been a lot of studies trying to, to follow the ecological studies to, to find out whether they can say that yes or no, vitamin D does affect the risk of cancer. Um, a lot of these are observational studies looking at serum 25-hydroxyvitamin D and cancer incidence. Well, it turns out from the ecological studies, it appears that vitamin D is more associated with cancer mortality rate than cancer incidence. Um, here, for example, is another ecological study by Bosco and Shimura in the United States. They used southern United States and northern United States, divided in two regions, left out the middle, and uh, just looked at latitude. Well, they looked at something, uh, sun expo uh, sunlight, annual sunlight uh, exposure. And what I've plotted, uh, graphed here, or, 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 or tabulated here, is the relative risk for mortality versus the relative risk for incidence. And a high number means that this is, they're comparing low versus high UVB. So high number is, is, means the beneficial effect. And what you see is that for these cancers, is generally they found a stronger effect for mortality than they did for incidence. Um, what I like to say is that there are many cancer risk modifying factors that affect cancer initiation. Vitamin D is only one of these factors. However, there are a few natural ways the body fights cancer once it starts to progress. Vitamin D is one of this. For example, it reduces angiogenesis and inhibits metastasis. Therefore, you might expect the vitamin D effect to be stronger for mortality rate than for incidence rate. Um, I've looked, there are a number of other ecological studies. Um, there's France, there's um, uh, China, got the United States, there's Australia. Um, there's also the supporting data from, from dietary intake, um, uh, serum levels, and so on. From all the uh, results, I put together this list of 17 cancers for which I think the, the evidence that vitamin D reduces the risk uh, is, is moderate to strong. This is the gastrointestinal cancers, colon, esophageal, gallbladder, gastric, pancreatic, and rectal. Urinary is bladder, kidney, and prostate. Females, breast, endometrial, ovarian, and vulvar, blood, you've got Hodgkin's, non-Hodgkin's, and you've got uh, miscellaneous lung and melanoma. There are some others like brain and leukemia, which is a little more marginal. Um, uh, these are the 13 cancers that have uh, support from oral intake. And so it's most of the ones that were on the first list with the addition of cervical cancer and oral pharyngeal cancer. But see, one of the problems is that when you get to a rare cancer, it's so difficult to study because you need a large number of people. And if you have a cohort study or something, it's just hard to get enough in that, in that cohort to, to really do the good statistics. So the reason ecological studies are powerful are several. 
First of all, cancers generally take 15 to 40 years to progress from initiation to detection or death. In fact, cancer even often can, the roots of cancer start in utero. Uh, if you start a study at the age of 40 or 50, you don't see the in utero effect. Um, there is, uh, I don't know if you're aware of the, the famous paper by uh, Bruce Armstrong and Richard Dahl in 1975. They looked at dietary links to cancer in about 35 countries and showed that almost all cancers, certainly cancers common in Western countries, were highly co correlated with total fat, especially animal fat in the national diet. For about three decades, that was pointed to as an example of the ecological fallacy because cohort studies such as at Harvard could not confirm that animal fat or meat or anything like that was a risk factor for breast cancer. Finally, it dawned on them uh, with a little nudging from people like T. Colin Campbell, uh, who's now a vegan after being raised on a dairy farm, that maybe the effect of diet was early in life. And it turns out that the more animal products in a person's diet early in life for a woman, the earlier she reaches sexual maturity and the more estrogen she produces. And est lifetime estrogen is a big risk factor for breast cancer. And so the dietary impact on breast cancer certainly occurred much earlier in life than could be seen in a study enrolling people after the age of 35 or so. And Harvard finally was able to confirm that. The younger people did have an effect from, from animal products. So the ecological stu studies integrate the effects of solar UVB and other factors over many years. Large numbers of cancer cases are included. Other risk modifying factors can be readily included in the study. The data are readily available, saving billions of dollars, pounds or euros, as well as many years of research. Now, their nested case control studies of breast and, and, and colorectal cancer versus serum 25-hydroxy vitamin D. Uh, these are useful in looking at um, uh, serum 25-hydroxy vitamin D level and, and cancer incidence rates for these two cancers. Uh, what I've shown is that um, there is a problem if you go too long in the analysis, uh, in the follow-up. For colorectal cancer, um, I've plotted here in a paper that's published uh, that if you look at the number of follow-up years and you look at the, um, the, the middle line is the regression to the, the, to the relative risk. The d dashed and, and, and dotted lines are the 95% confidence intervals. Um, there are two or three outliers, but if you look at most of the studies, uh, even out to 14 years, you find that the 95% confidence interval is less than one. So it's statistically significant except in, in one or two studies. And you notice that the, the lowest, the best risk reduction uh, is for the case control study, right at time equals zero. Um, for breast cancer, after three years, nobody has found a statistically significant inverse correlation between serum 25-hydroxy vitamin D and breast cancer incidence. Uh, um, when the Institute of Medicine put together, it was, was directed by the Food and Drug Administration and NIH to look at uh, set new guidelines for vitamin D. They were expressly, express, expressly told, don't include case control studies, don't include any study in which UV is a source of vitamin D. Only use nested case control studies and randomized controlled trials. Essentially, they hamstrung the committee on purpose. Um, now, nonetheless, you can use these studies to look at dose-response relationships. And I do a poor man's version of a meta-analysis. I take, I take the published data, I, I, I plot the uh, odds ratio as a function of the median for each quartile or quintile, quantile. I then adjust the odds ratio so that all the points sort of line up along the same regression line. And um, uh, from this, uh, for example, for, for um, colorectal cancer, find that if one went from 54 nanomoles per liter to 105 nanomoles per liter, there'd be a 30% reduction in um, colorectal cancer incidence. Of course, if you have, take people start at 10 or 20 and increase by 20 or 30 nanomoles, you're going to get a greater increase, uh, risk, uh, greater reduction. Uh, for breast cancer, it's a very similar uh, effect. There's more interest now in, in vitamin D and survival. Uh, here's an example from a Harvard study. They found that those who had 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels, a, a mean, uh, an average of, of 100 nanomoles per liter 
at time of diagnosis had about half the mortality rate over, I forget, I don't know how many years, as those with an average of about four, 40 nanomoles per liter. There have been a number of studies for breast. You've got a 50% difference in mortality rate over 12 years, I think, or, uh, from in, in Toronto. Uh, the colorectal lung cancer, 25% uh, difference uh, for non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, Newton Bishop, the 20% 20, 20 increase relapse-free survival multiple myeloma, non-Hodgkin's B-cell um, lymphoma, and prostate cancer, better pro prognosis in, in Norway. So uh, no matter that there's only one good randomized controlled trial, the, the, the observational evidence does show that people who have more vitamin D at time of diagnosis do have a much better uh, out, uh, uh, prognosis. Now prostate cancer is, is a, a funny one. Uh, there are studies showing that UV exposure early in life and sufficient UVB exposure to cause non-melanoma skin cancer throughout life are inversely correlated with prostate cancer incidence. On the other hand, observational studies of serum 25-hydroxyvitamin D for follow-up periods up to 28 years have not been, in general, found correlated with prostate cancer incidence. Vitamin D seems to affect the risk of prostate cancer early in life and may protect against metastasis. Uh, and I'll get to that tool hemostatic before we're over here. If you look at the map for prostate cancer and compare it with colon cancer, you see that in prostate cancer, the high rates are in the northwest, the lowest rates are in the south, southeast. That's the inverse of what we have for colon cancer, or it's, 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 it's a mirror image of what you have for colon cancer. That has always that has bugged me for about 10 years. I mean, I've, I've been trying to look at it and trying to figure out. I've gone through various hypotheses, such as maybe, maybe there's a viral risk factor that affects men early in life, uh, and if they have low vitamin D in the winter, that can, can spread to a, a prostate infection, which I guess is later in life. Um, Tim Oliver seems to think that may be happening. I'm not so sure. But what I found about a year ago, or two years ago now, I found the map of greatest ancestry by county in the United States and saw many features that were correlated between the two maps. Um, in the upper part of the country where it's blue, you have a lot of people with German or British ancestry. Down in the southwest, you have a lot of people with the Hispanic ancestry. Um, uh, in the northeast, you have you've got Russians, you've got Finns, you've got Italians, you've got uh, Irish. And I saw a high correlation between ethnic background and, and prostate cancer uh, uh, mortality rate. Um, so I did a, I, I also in the United States, the, the African Americans, they're not on this map, this is only white Americans, which includes Hispanics. The African Americans have about twice the prostate cancer mortality rate uh, or, or even higher than white Americans. So I, hypothesized that perhaps the same gene that's a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease and coronary heart disease, uh, apolipoprotein E epsilon 4, might be a risk factor for prostate cancer. Um, and I did an ecological study involving 122 countries using that dietary supply values and per capita gross domestic product. Uh, in the full data set, per capita GDP lack of cereal consumption, milk protein, and APOA epsilon 4 were significantly correlated with incidence explaining 60% of the variance. In the smaller uh, subset, uh, uh, excluding Africa, um, you got similar results. And the interpretation is that cholesterol has been identified as an important risk factor for prostate cancer. The APOE epsilon 4 allele, which is common in hunter-gatherer populations, is Africans, Inuit, Polynesians, Melanesians, any who live on hunting and gathering uh, uh, rather than agricultural production, they have a much higher prevalence. The Bushmen up to 45 percent, Africans 30, 35 percent, Inuits 30 percent, whereas if you get down to uh, Kuwait and, 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 and Thailand, it's maybe 8 percent. So it's producing cholesterol uh, in order to try to store all excess food as fat and producing more insulin so it takes the cholesterol into the cells. Um, and um, uh, there's also a recent study just came out about uh, two weeks ago from Washington State showing that fish consumption 
was a risk factor for high grade uh, aggressive prostate cancer. And I looked in literature and found there, there are studies showing that uh, DHA from fish oil increases low density lipoprotein cholesterol and reduces triglycerides. Um, and so um, cholesterol is a risk factor for prostate cancer. Turns out tri triglycerides are associated with reduced risk of prostate cancer. So it looked like fish oil was, was producing lipids in the blood that, that were increasing risk of, of prostate cancer. Now if you look at the Tohema, Tohema study that was been talked about, uh, that was done in Nordic countries. Turns out most of the effect was found in Norway. Uh, about 58 or so of the 68 cases at the higher level of vitamin D were from Norway. Norway has about the highest fish consumption in the world, uh, other than maybe Japan. They have, on average, six or seven grams of fish oil per day in the national diet. Finland and Sweden only had about three grams of fish oil uh, per day. Uh, fish is a good a source of vitamin D. So it looks as if fish consumption was a confounding factor. Now, they did talk about, they, at that time, the, the understanding was that fish reduced the risk of prostate cancer. But if you take this new evidence and think about it, and then the fact that they had a 17-year observational period, who knows whether the serum level at 17 years corresponded to the, the level uh, you know, throughout the study. So unfortunately, well, when I was in atmospheric studies, um, the people who didn't like see, um, carbon dioxide, didn't want to control carbon dioxide and were looking at all of the outlier data and saying that's why we shouldn't control coal combustion, uh, we call those people confusionists. And I think the people who point to these U-shaped curves are the modern-day confusionists in the vitamin D story. Um, anyway, there is a recent study from Harvard uh, showing that, that vitamin D is inversely correlated with high-grade um, prostate cancer um, or, or, or mortality rate. So there is a benefit for, for vit vitamin D for prostate cancer. It does reduce metastasis. It does reduce angiogenesis. It just appears in my book that it doesn't have any of Im impact between initiation and when you get to metastasis uh, at the, uh, you know, after about 40 years. Sort of, they're sort of simmering for many, many, many years. Now, the question is, do UVB and vitamin D satisfy the criteria for causality for cancer? Uh, the highly regarded British statistician and epidemiologist A. Bradford Hill in 1965 laid down the criteria for causality in a biological system at his presidential address to the British Medical Society. The important um, criteria include strength of association, consistency, biological gradient, plausibility, coherence, experimental verification, and analogy. Randomized controlled trial is but one of the criteria that can be used in, in, a, in a system like this. Uh, vitamin D is not a drug. Vitamin D is a natural substance from sunlight with which we will live for years. Therefore, there's plenty of observational data that can be used and have been used. And the, uh, to me, the idea that we have to wait for randomized controlled trials to say that, yes, vitamin D does do something, is, is a delay tactic um, based on not wanting vitamin D either to enhance the profits of the drug industry or the specialists or to protect the retirement systems of the countries. But it's not based on science. Uh, my answer is yes, for overdone types of cancer, the uh, criteria are satisfied, and I published this in a paper in 2009. So in conclusion, the hypothesis, the UVB vitamin D cancer hypothesis generally satisfies the criteria for causality in number of cancers. Uh, it takes levels, I would say, actually between 100 and 150 nanomoles per liter um, uh, to provide reasonable protection many, against many types of cancer. As of May 10th, of this year, there are 2,413 papers with vitamin D and cancer in the title or abstract listed at pubmed.gov. Now, let me just, if I got another couple of minutes here, go to a couple other topics. Uh, one is I have done a number of studies um, on what would happen if the population serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D level were raised from 54, which seems to be the worldwide average, um, to 105 nanomoles per liter, which is uh, the minimum you can say would be beneficial based on dose-response relationships. Take the reduction factor, look at the reduced number of, 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 cancer, of, of deaths, and um, this is for Europe, okay. So what I find is that, that for, for Europe, 
uh, for if you have a total of 9.49 million deaths per year, you could reduce 1.97 uh, million of those, or about 21 percent of, of the cancer of the deaths could be considered premature based on low vitamin D levels. Now, again, one of my um, um, cheap uh, or home done graphical meta analyses shows from, from looking at four or five studies of, of all cause mortality rate versus 25 hydroxy vitamin D that there would be a 26 percent reduction in going from 54 to 105 nanomoles per liter. This is based on people over age 45 at time of enrollment. Many people don't get to age 45, so the 21 percent I have is, is a reasonable agreement with, with this result. And I do have a paper coming out in the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition in July, which is a global, a worldwide analysis like this, um, what would happen in every con continent. It turns out that in Africa they have a, an average life expectancy of 45 years, in uh, Europe more like 75 years. Nonetheless, in every country, in every continent, you get about a two-year life extension by raising the serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels to that amount. Um, you would have direct and indirect costs for healthcare may drop by 10 percent, and this is the most cost-effective way to reduce uh, disease uh, rates. In the United States, a year supply of vitamin D at 3,000 or 4,000 IU per day costs about $10, about seven pounds. Uh, you can't beat that. Now I have a, a project, the final thing I want to talk about is I have a project with John Connell, the Vitamin D Council, to produce documents, scientific documents and, and, and patient-friendly documents on the what, is the, what is known about the evidence that ultraviolet radiation and vitamin D reduce the risk of these diseases, or in some cases has actually increased the risk. Um, I've been spent over a year on this. Uh, it's been uh, pretty much full time the last two or three months. Um, these have gone online today. Can I ask you which of the major diseases or conditions you think um, are actually reduce the vitamin D? Are reduced by vitamin D? The, the, the diseases reduce the vitamin D, yes. Like say, you know that the drugs perhaps tamoxifen, if you're on breast cancer and tamoxifen, your vitamin D will be reduced. What, what other examples are there? You, you, you well, it's more the treatment. It's more the drugs that are used for treating, like right. glucocorticoids. Uh, corticoids. It's also like if people get melanoma or skin cancer, they think it better stay out of the sun. Right. Um, I forget, there, there are some others. There are, there's MRSA, um, the, the uh, bacteria that eat the, eat the the skin. Turns out that's more common in summer, which appears that the UV uh, impairs the surface immune function, and so it's less able to fight the bacteria. Thank you. If, if I could add something to that, at the conference that we were at in, Mad in Madrid, there were about 12 or 15 drugs which, in which they worked well with vitamin D, or vitamin D enhanced their operation. And there was only one that was antagonistic, and I didn't make a note of it at the time. No, it was. I think it was live data from from uh, from from case studies. And sorry, it's called cousins. It's something on the And um, I will go back to the organizer of that conference who hasn't published the papers online yet and um, see if we can get that information. And, and, and Carol, I think and you mentioned something that in the meeting in Germany a few days later, uh, after that, after our April meeting, there was uh, a pharmacist who spoke. There, there were quite a number of drugs that um, and that reduce the absorption of vitamin D. And I do not have that list. We will post it as soon as we get it. My apologies even if, well, I'm not apologizing for bringing it up. I want you as cancer people to be aware uh, and start paying attention to that. Uh, I just don't have the detail today. How are the medications for reducing seizures? They interfere with vitamin yes. D metabolism. Yes. So sodium valproate and penicillin, apparently. Mm -hmm. 